All right, welcome to the Project Awaken podcast. This is Parker's painting, Parker's paintings from Maui. Is that you said Hawaii? Yeah. Um, I think it is pretty cool how we can like talk to each other from so far across the world. But um, when I first started like looking into you, and I was like, okay, I want to interview this guy, so I have to find out certain things about him. Um, the way I want to describe it, describe you as a man of art but also a man of spirituality and curiosity in life itself, almost as if life is art itself. Um, so you said a lot of good things, especially about meditation, um, when it comes your ego, ego death, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we're going to get into that. But I want to talk about you for a second because you do some awesome art. And I've also got plenty of pictures to show of that art. Um, like this, this is awesome. I love this one. And you've been doing this for how long now? Oh, my whole life. I made like a bunch of art as a kid and honestly just never really stopped. I uh, just kind of kept yeah. it going. Yeah. I mean, that picture's amazing. And um, I was saying to you before you started the stream that it wasn't always like this, you know? Like I got this picture here, if you even remember posting this one. Oh yeah. Um, this, you know, this is still very good, and so is this, but progress, those were in 2013, so you get to here, and damn, huge improvements. Um, what, what made you want to do art and continue down that path? Has it always just been something that you've enjoyed doing since a kid, or? Yeah, yeah, I've been doing it since I was a kid. Um, just always found it as, like, a, a fun thing to do. I, you know, went through, like, a bunch of different phases with it so at different points in life it it was being done for different reasons let's say you know yeah. as you know when I was a kid it was one reason teenager young adult etc so that's kind of evolved and you can sort of see the art that I make evolve as like why yeah. I'm making art evolves as well like yeah. the content the subject matter and stuff like that the actual concepts of the art a lot of it's um, extremely spiritual uh, or sometimes out of spacey which is my kind of shit i like that um but when you are doing when you do this art is it just is, it's a form of almost meditation as if it's like um you're kind of zoned out simply although you recognize you're in physical you're in shifted into a state of consciousness that you feel as if you're just your brain and you're just compelling your ideas from your brain into action or is it more or is it more yeah, there's, just some, like, there's some painting. work that's like that. There's some work yeah. that's like flow state like that. Like you can do certain practices that are geared towards that, like um, creating that mental state. Um, yeah. Like especially if you like if you've ever done pieces that are like um, every in breath you make like a stroke and then every out breath you make another stroke and you can kind of like literally make right. it a meditation. But honestly, yeah. most of my work has been in a way to try to create work that's actualizing an idea and is putting that into a visual language. And yeah. for me, you know, it was a lot of like the meditative part of it was as I was making each piece, I was thinking about those concepts and I was constantly asking myself, is yeah. what I'm doing in this artwork translating that through visual language? Uh, Am I making it something that somebody could read into and understand the idea like I'm thinking of it? So that's kind yeah. of how it was for me. It was, it was it, I would think of it more like contemplation more than meditation. Yeah, oh, I, I totally understand that because I'd say that's when I do my digital art and stuff. When I do the art, it's almost so I can convey an exterior message if yeah. that's what you're trying to get through. Um, yeah. and a lot of the easiest ways I do this is from psychedelics and that kind of stuff. And this is the question I wanted to ask you because um, the guy who did the podcast with last time, White Knuckle, he didn't, I didn't see him bring up psychedelics. So I'm curious as to your experiences with them, if you've tried them, all that kind of stuff, because I find them quite profound. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. Um, I, I've found uh, a whole phase of my life to be quite experimental and Yep. You know, psychedelics was a part of that. Um, you know, um, 
you know, for everyone, it's, it's very different. Uh, for me, I had a lot of very positive, uh, mind-opening experiences. Um, yeah, connecting with nature, uh, with good people, with you know, with heart-focused intentions, and um, a lot of that was at like music festivals or even just in nature with my friends. And yeah, uh, um, yeah a lot of times I would incorporate some of the things that I had you know, visually seen on those experiences into some of the artwork. Um, but for me, it was mostly like um, sort of expediting the spiritual path for me, like, you know, artwork and the spiritual path for me has gone kind of hand in hand because I generally yeah. make art about the stuff that's happening in my life. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so to answer your question, yeah, I've definitely experimented with psychedelics. And um, for me, they had a positive and profound uh, result. Yeah, um, and I found that although psychedelics do that, so does meditation, and even more so. I say it all the time. Med meditation can be a crazy drug when you get uh, to the yeah. wit's end of it, and you know yeah. you can end up sitting in wherever you're meditating for hours in a state of just complete, uh, complete nirvana. You know, and that's what that's kind of what we all want to achieve. But um, when you were talking about meditation on some of the things you know some of your TikToks, your instagram and include the podcast i watched um you kind of said as if you close your eyes and it's reflecting almost like you were you were just seeing your thoughts mm. and the information you've previously processed is that what you are trying to convey by saying that or are you trying to say that meditation is simply a form of stress relief and um it's almost recognizing yourself because um it's, sorry, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to it you know because is, is it does you think there's a lot of layers because i'm wondering if you think it's um is, it stops at a certain point or meditation is something you can do quite transcendently properly and it's something that everyone should do yeah i think first of all everyone should definitely do it um okay yeah. meditation is like the healthy slow road that psychedelics kind of um launches Fast. past you know yeah. a little bit um i now basically don't use any substances at all i'm super sober and clean and vegan and the whole thing and i just simply meditate now i find that it's um it's something that's easier to incorporate some of like the the, the spiritual work and the lessons from into like uh, being a little bit more like grounded and something that you can like hold on to and incorporate more easily yeah. and the layers that I was talking about is kind of like when you begin to meditate in the very beginning, there's so much uh, going on in the mind. There's so much chaos. There's so many uh, frequent thoughts that come from past experience or just things yeah, that are on the mind. Slip. They come and go. Yeah. yeah. And in the beginning, you're simply trying to create a little bit of focus and concentration so that you can find some in that kind of a mental space and yeah. then as that progresses and you find that poise um then you're able mental to sort of poise. watch that's watch what you things refer to come and go yeah. yeah i usually call it mental poise because once you gain a little bit of groundedness in 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 the in the role of an observer of the mind rather than being kind of off on every tangent like a traveler, you're, you're sort of there observing the whole thing. Once you get to that point, yeah, that's observer. when yeah. the real work can begin. And you can start to see um, things come up and pass. Um, and, and as Close. you do that, I've found that um, you're not energizing the same stuff. It's, you're, you're essentially looking to gain a, like that mental poise is also called equanimity. Um, yeah. And to remain equanimous, to not crave towards something or to avert or to run from something so yeah. you're in that in that middle where you're not like if something comes up yeah. that's positive you're not like trying to keep it there and if something comes yeah. up that's negative you're not trying to push it away exactly. uh, you're sort of allowing in a way i realize and, that yeah. um when like even now especially with meditation this helps because the best description of meditation on very simplistic form i think is um, saying that you close your eyes and then all you are left with now is already processing inf information information that is already you've already 
taken through your eyes and your sensories and now you have left to think about it, dwell on it or simply push it away and focus on what is the actual present, like what actually makes your life and creates your future and past. But um, uh, how can you apply what you get from meditation into real life? Because I seem to be able to apply it even at work. Now I medit so I meditate once or twice a day, every day it's something that I have to do. And um, if I don't do it, I feel weird because I don't feel connected almost with myself. Um, and I can go to work now and I zone out and I recognize, you know, when I get happy, I make myself happy. Like I'm, and I continue to want to be happy. And then you realize that you're trying to make yourself happy and you're like, oh, okay, now it's old. It's cool. And it's the same with sad, you know, you try to make yourself, you make yourself feel sad. And then at what point do you stop? You know, you're crying, you're like, well, shit, I'm just going to keep crying for the sake of it. It's a almost an unconscious unruling control of your emotions you can't control it properly you know and that's what i think meditation really helps with the controlling of your emotions and your actual self yeah it's it comes down to the reaction right like yeah what like you could put an apple in front of two different people and based on their history with apples they're gonna either be happy or sad about that apple being in the room right yeah and it's that's how you can start to see that it's really just how we react to stuff. And that's why yeah. I said like that equanimity that you find in meditation um, through the right training and just sticking with it then translates into the real world because then when the thought of sadness comes up, you're not as prone to just go with it. You're not as prone to, you're, you're more likely to observe it and allow it yeah. to dissipate in the same way that you do in meditation rather than run with it on a tangent of thought or that becomes yeah. emotion and going with it and all of a sudden it's your whole day. Um, so for me, it's been the application in the real day to day grind is taking that mental poise and that role of the observer with whatever comes up during the day in the moment yeah, of and course. being sort of okay with whatever is, whether Whatever happens, because everything's just being until you give it some sort of meaning. Everything just happens, you know? Um, I feel like for some reason, our society, especially Western culture and first world countries, we tend to have this belief that um, everything happens for a reason and um, not everything is just happens, you know? We have some sort of belief that everything is existential and beyond us, but um, what would you say to people that think you? Because I, that think that, because I have a strong belief that you think to the contrary, to be honest, that everything is somewhat just being until you give it some kind of meaning or morphemization or like- uh, It really depends on the individual. It's, to me, it yeah, depends exactly. on, again, like the perception of the individual and what that person sees in that, object like if you think about it like this like you know how like when you do dream analysis of like you're looking at you were sleeping and in your dream there was i don't know an octopus and it said yeah make sure to check the oven or something like that right you you would look at those things symbolically right you're not actually thinking about an octopus the octopus represents something and yeah. check on the oven represents some stress about something you feel you need to like keep tabs on now, yeah. if you were to apply that to day-to-day -day life and you were to think of your day-to-day -day life in a dream-like way, you would analyze every little exchange in some sort of deeper way, right? Like, what, exactly. wh where is like a lesson here? Like I often, like I made a TikTok about like, if you look at life in this way, it's almost like every exchange is kind of like a pop quiz. like. Where's the yeah. deeper thing here? Like what, yeah. what is what this person saying or doing triggering in you so that you feel certain ways and how are you going to handle this situation? So it becomes this opportunity really, like you can analyze it in a deep way quickly. Then you can see, oh, there's a lesson here. Like I mm. should handle this better. I've seen this similar situation 10, a hundred times, thousand times. Yeah. 
here's another opportunity for me to evolve in some fashion. But it takes that like, again, that mental poise from meditation to be able to be observant about that kind of a thing and then to quickly sort of look as deeply as possible and then choose more consciously how you would like to react to that stimulus yeah. or not react to that stimulus. Totally agree. And I think um, we are too caught on thinking we're living a story rather than being the witness to life. And like after this, this psychedelics helped so much with this, I found um, finding meaning in such basic things. You know, you pop some, take some mushrooms, you can look around your room and you will find very profound meanings within yourself just looking at the desk on a table sure. um, and I feel like the difference the good thing about soberness is that you can still find the beauty you find on psychedelics fully sober it's just a matter of manipulating your mind into liking things that aren't so um, hard to get you know we, we, we want to find happiness and fulfill ourselves with things that are very hard to achieve and aren't basic in our everyday life and we wonder as to why we aren't happy um and there's also one thing i really want to talk to you about which was the concept of age physical and actual a state of um conscious development so i'm 18 and i feel as if um some people uh definitely travel different in different directions i gotta say this properly otherwise it'll sound rude but um some people grow up in different environments and express themselves differently and end up in different states of consciousness and you could be 50 like a lot of the politicians you could be 50 and absolutely have no concept of yourself just concept of being yourself for other people's for other people which um i'd really like to ask your opinion about on the concepts of actual age from a physical standpoint and does it matter compared to age from a mental standpoint and an actual knowledge standpoint experience yeah, so, standpoint. yeah so i tend to look past the physical um yeah. that the physical body has um only will so, only show you age appropriate to how much like material world experience that person has right so if, yeah. if you're speaking to somebody who has you know a lot of years under their belt they're older and they're going to know quite well how like worldly things occur or they'll at least be biased to think that they do and then yeah. when it comes to somebody who may be quite young um they may be more spiritually or um their consciousness might be more evolved to a point where um they understand some of the more subtler truths uh behind the veil of reality Fresh eyes. yeah things like empathy things like compassion um inner joy you know they 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 simply might have lived through more life lessons, through more reincarnations, yeah. to the point where now, even if they're younger in their physical body, they could be more evolved um, than somebody older than them physically. Um, and you see this like Greta Thorn Thornburg, it, you know, as an environmentalist, is quite young, but she's quite evolved and has a broader perspective and a well-spoken yeah. throat chakra yeah. mind. Very like well she's spoken. sharp, right? Yeah. And um, the, like you said, the politicians that she's speaking to are, in this analogy, uh, the, the children that she is addressing in the school, right? Quite literally. And yeah. uh, even though, like one thing I'll hit on though, is like with public figures, you often do run into them projecting certain facades, even though they may in fact know that what they're doing yeah. um, on a deeper level, you're, you may still just be getting a certain persona um but that's i think that's like that's kind of how i look at it off. yeah i think that's a great explanation and got excited there reincarnation are you buddhist do you believe in buddhism um all that buddhist kind of stuff the only ones that believe in reincarnation the hindus and a lot of people do um, oh I've, yeah a lot of those asian religions do believe in it but i find buddhism being the main central source of it 
um, especially with the books that I read. I would say Hinduism as well. I would say Hinduism as well. Yeah, um, uh, I'm reading a book now about the Dalai Lama and the path of Buddhism through that. And that is a lot about reincarnation. I'm sure other religions also have it. Sure. Um, sure. And actually, I'm the, the majority of them are. I'm not too sure, not too well versed in it. But um, yeah, the act of reincarnation, you think this is almost like the 333-666-999 stages where you reincarnate and progress into a higher state of conscious being and keep progressing or what is your um, perspective on reincarnation sure yeah um so yeah like you said there's a lot of different um groups that um, attribute um spiritual growth and the ability to grow over a longer period of time to reincarnation essentially as like a logistical means to give uh, more time to the whole thing, which which to me yeah. makes logical sense because a hundred years in a one-off to me from looking at like how much work actually needs to be done just doesn't seem like enough. Um, oh, and okay. that, you know, when you also look at people who um, study uh, like uh, hypnotherapy, a lot of, there's a lot of texts on hypnotherapy that end up moving towards past life regressions. And in those studies, there's a lot of um, evidence of soul families who have been together working on certain issues for long, long periods of time. Like you and your mother and your brother and your sister may have been playing different roles of parents and siblings for long, Mm. long times. And yeah, yeah, so I, you know, I I learned about it through Buddhism um, and the um the way that they put it is that yeah essentially um that there is a a wheel of reincarnation and the goal would be to exit needing or basically unchaining yourself from this constant rolling thing and it has to do entirely with um the attachments or the connection, the desires and all the things that bind us to the material world, things like yeah. lust and greed and selfishness, etc. cetera. Um, and through the practices of compassion, empathy, and letting go of all of these types of things, again, equanimity towards whatever's coming up by not creating new attachments and new karmic yeah. influences. Um, and thus moving yourself quickly towards the exit, if you would. Um, And that the school that we're in here, um, uh, you know, that's how, that's why it's interesting to see like young people come in and be very evolved um, because you can almost tell, well, they may be, you know, they may be further along than me, even if they're younger, like we were talking about earlier. So, so yeah, that's, that's definitely how I look at it is, from that perspective like even if you have as they say like chains of um you know poverty or 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 chains of gold like whether even like you know gautama buddha was a prince right like he had everything you could possibly ask for Uh, and those are still chains of gold like they're still really nice but you're still attached you know, he partied a lot when he was a kid, but then he saw suffering and he saw yeah, you know, he a left way the yeah. to, to let go of it. And so, yeah, like, I guess when it comes to reincarnation, to me, it seems like the, a logical means for just more more time to learn the lessons and to let go Most and definitely. eventually transcend yeah. this school and move on to the next one. Yeah, I agree. It's logical. And the the perception you have isn't what the majority of people have and they think that that isn't logical because it's against science and um i want to pick your brain about this because i believe that science isn't necessarily true but nor is spirituality neither of them are true without each other they're almost they're, they're combined it's a combination of both of the physicality and then the observers that observe you know, and are able to experience the physicality that's made. Um, what's your opinion on that? Because, you know, even from a quantum physics level, it proves that reincarnation is, could be a possible thing. Like, we don't know. We don't know if it's true or not. So, um, I certainly don't think science and, you know, a nihilism 
is the answer and I don't think you do. So what would you say to people who do believe that, that like when we die it just goes black and we're just monkeys who run around this earth picking, fucking and building shit? Like, uh, what do you reckon? Do you reckon that's true? I think science is attempting to catch up to spirituality because science has to work with what's observable, yeah. right? It has to work with what you can see, what you can quantify. And a lot of spirituality is able to simply go around that and work with uh, the more ethereal. And was already processed. Yeah. Yeah, something that might be more perspective based. And it's interesting because they they support each other, in fact, and they are this, they're, they're two languages talking about the same stuff. It's just that. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, science, like when, like in a more, let's, let's, let's hypothesize in a more evolved society that has, let's say, telepathy, that would be more quantifiably observable and regular to the point where then science would be able to put it into its rigors and figure out experiments to be able to then show that that's a provable science. But, yeah. you know, that's where you find like fringe sciences and stuff like that, right? Um, but like a, a couple of clear examples here are like, um, you know, in the mechanics of consciousness, um, we find the observer effect is a real scientific quantifiable effect that simply can't be explained by anything other than consciousness interacting with the material world, which is thoroughly, thoroughly laid out in spirituality, right? Yeah. So there's, that's why I say there's languages talking about the same stuff. It's just that the rigors of science demand um, a little bit more than a leap of faith in, yes, in, in, of course. in their community. Yeah, I totally agree. And that was once again, very well explained. Um, you said telepathy before, and a lot of people think that's crazy. It's like a movie, uh, sci-fi kind of thing. But I've had somewhat the experience myself. Or I don't, I don't want to say I've done telepathy, but it's a connection almost ill-explained. I think we do have telepathy with uh, other spiritually open, conscious people a lot of the time, but we don't. We aren't able to um, part it away from what it is his thoughts and around certain people who I feel are more conscious and are more aware of their being, I can almost feel their th feel their thoughts and surroundings and I'm only starting to notice it as I meditate more and understand myself and become more happy with just being myself that um, you actually can feel people, you feel the vibe. Like you can feel vibes from people once you begin to learn yourself and understand yourself more on a deeper level. And with telepathy, it is proven on a quantum level. The FBI, um, sorry, the CIA unleaked documents on that in 1990 something, um, along with the world being a hologram. So do you believe that, like a holography style structure that we can't understand because we are the, you know, we are the numbers inside the numbers, we are the data. That's why we can't almost grasp the fact that we live in a holographic structure, um, on a physical plane in which we are the observer the observer that observes everything that is made like the the things i don't know how to explain it properly it's very complex and um it definitely is levels to it but as a whole do you think that this is uh hol holography and your opinion on telepathy and how we can actually do it Sure. So the holographic model is actually a really solid theory. Um, yeah. You know, all parts contained in each piece, um, and the whole, the map of the whole within each little part. Um, and it, you know, it makes sense, right? Like the kingdom of God is within, as they say, right? And mm. um, I think that the the reasoning behind why some individuals this comes more easily to as far as like 
sort of the skills that come with connectivity or oneness, um, like telepathy, like whatever, um, like Jesus walking on water or whatever, that those individuals are much further along in their conscious awareness. And so for them to witness the, uh, the, the grand interconnectedness of all things is mm, within their capabilities mentally, emotionally, in their belief structures, etc. They've gotten to that point in where if you were to think of the entire mass of the population of the planet, there it would be like Ishtak Bentov has this in one of his texts, and he's the guy that actually released the gateway documents that you're talking about. He's the one who was working on them. Yep. He's who was hired. That author, that guy, he describes it as like a bell curve, which is almost like this. So it's like that. Yep. Like if if you were to think of the population, it would be on a bell curve like that. Like the beginning would be like Neanderthalic types who are pretty dense. And then like the mass, the, the majority would be somewhere in the middle where you like think of the average person, right? And they're yeah. definitely not, you know, as sharp, but they're not total idiots where you get a lot of, but they are like easily swayed by propaganda and this kind of a thing, yeah. right? And then the people who you're talking about that are a little sharper, that can sense the vibe, that can maybe, um, you know, have a more observer role in their own mind, that are a little bit more self-aware, et cetera, they would be a little further on that front end of the bell curve. Um, and that, back to the reincarnation thing, that we've been evolving on bell curves as a soul through all of the different uh, strata of life, right? From minerals to plants to animals to now humans and then onward. And that as you go from Neanderthal to wizard or magician, essentially, um, that you gain some of these um, uh, awareness capabilities, um, but that they're not yeah. to be grasped on is like the thing I keep hearing in the spiritual text is like, even as these subtle awareness capabilities increase in the student that they're not to stop there and simply you know um like worry about them so much that that's like the end all be all that that's the goal yeah. because that's just one step along, along the way to yeah. the next entire right to like see that experience that and still apply like you know the the under underarching laws of the universe, like love, like, you know, um, basically being a good person, et cetera, like in, embodying yeah. that stuff and, and just using the tools in that way, in a positive manner as such. So yeah, that's kind of how I look yeah. at it. That's a long answer. But yeah, that was, that was good. Um, do you think we only reincarnate back to earth or because it, I don't know if you, you've probably seen the YouTube videos of how big the universe is, it's massive and we're like a, like a speck of sand you know there's there's less grains of yeah. sand on earth than there is um so not solar systems than there is planets in the universe um so do you think we reincarnate back to earth as if we are part of this mother nature's goal like as in we are, are stuck one of the stuck observers that continually keep reincarnating because i think that would make sense it would um fix the issue that the generational issue um, as such the previous generation they left things worst off for us um, and do you think we just keep reincarnating because if we did then in reality everything bad we do to the earth now will affect us later which actually makes a bit of yin yang sense there mm. so like do you think it's always reincarnating back to earth or into the universe we go off the different types of physicality from millions of light years away. I don't think about it as linearly. I, I, I think that like my perspective on it at the moment, which is subject to change, um, is if you think about all of creation or the universe as you're putting it, the, the, the observable use of the universe, the physical universe that you're describing to me would be one chapter in that book it would be a much larger thing and that yeah. all of time is also a part of it so like even if we just for a moment talk about just the physical 
dimension of can you incarnate just to Earth or can you incarnate to other livable planets with societies, etc., to be able to learn lessons in those different planets? Exactly, yeah. Sure, it's entirely possible. It's also on top of that possible to incarnate in different times, right? Like if if you think about like if you pass away, you die, you end up outside of physical reality and for you at that point, doesn't it seem logical that you would have a few things you're still looking to work on, right? Let's sure. say you're in, you know, the, you're having trouble with acceptance of one thing or another, that you would look at not only the observe the physical universe, but all of the dimensions available for a point in space time. So at any time and at any point in space where it would be most uh, the best school, the best like available like How classroom. How exciting is that? Yeah, so How exciting it might be, would that be? It might be nine, 1920 America, it might be 820 BC Egypt. Rick and Morty, it, fuck. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. So yeah. that's why the, there's the idea that on a on a higher plane, you are actually experiencing all of your lives concurrently that the that the ego is down here living this one linearly but that on a higher level all of them are happening all together all of the time um yeah. and it would be like i'm guessing at this point i mean obviously all of this is theoretical but like the theory that my mind goes to at this point is that it would seem that certain civilizations in certain dimensions right so like let's say just in the physical dimension Let's just make it simple and say that the Earth is a lower grade civilization and that let's say there's just one other planet in the whole universe. It's, there's probably more, but let's just say one is higher evolved, right? They, I'd they're, hope so. They're what you would think of as, as us in a couple million years, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, let's say that you were working on, like, let's say that on Earth, you got to the tip of this bell curve and you were like borderline levitating whenever you wanted to, you would probably incarnate next time at that other planet, right? Like yes. you'd still be in the yeah. physical universe, but you'd land on the other planet. You'd go through whatever work they're doing there. And then it seems like when you got to like the tip of the 3D or physical dimension, the highest lessons you had learned here possible, that then you would start to move up into less physical dimensions, more ethereal astral dimensions yeah. where civilizations in that kind of an environment would be dealing with less physical stuff. That was already learned. You don't really need that stuff. Um, and that it would be more emotional based, mental based, that you wouldn't really be able to even live in a society where every thought projects into a real thing if you hadn't gone through the whole other the actual part, you know, process yeah. of this. Um, so you say 3d dimensions now it, this is actually science like somewhat scientific as well but it's all theories um if this is a holography style structure it could mean that information can be um still grasped by 2d things like trees they grasp information on a 2d structure rather than 3d as they grow they're on a, on a molecular basis they are the molecules and they are still accumulating information as an observer, but they almost are the physicality and witnessing it on a 2D, super uh, realistic level, you know? Um, the actual dimensions, although we are seeing everything in 3D, trees would not see that. They would simply be 2D layers of molecular structures that just continue to grow and sprout until they eventually die. Hmm. And is that, I think that is a part of um, the observatory meaning to life. Because um, it, it's still observing in a way, it's still kind of giving information about what physicality is, how that grows. And I, someone explained it better, but um, I'm just wondering if you have an opinion on that. As in, imagine being, of, you know, I mean, when a mushroom I, the only grows. way I can wrap my mind around it is imagine being a tree. Like what, like what does that experience that, feel exactly. like? You know? Yeah. And, um, you know, that kind of hits on the idea that philosophers have hit on for a long time, which is 
why are we here? Like, what is this all? Like, why create the universe to have all these experiences of a tree, of a human, of two guys on a podcast? Like, why? You know, and yeah, um, I think that hits on the bigger that that bigger question. Like, that's an interesting thing to think of, like the experience of a tree. But it immediately draws my mind to like, why would a creator of a universe even want to experience as a tree? Right? Like. And are we so are we all just these little uh, sensory sensitive nerve endings on one big brain? You know, like on one. Uh, big that's what I was about to say. Mind. Like we are yeah. the observers for an exterior consciousness, one symbiotic thing, one consciousness that collects it from. Well, in this case, billions and trillions of different observers just on this planet, like. Yeah. Um, and that's why i say to people i am you and you are me because i'm a reflection of you and you are a reflection of me in reality that's how it works no matter how individual we are at the end of the day we are still a collective and it's not about just being a collective or just being an individual it's about being both and having recognition of both i believe yeah like like the other day i listened to a good one from Sadhguru, who's this uh indian mystic he's amazing and he said, you know, have you ever played with like soap bubbles as a kid and you blow the bubbles and they kind of float around or whatever, right? And if you think about like life as like, I've collected this energy, this is my body, that's your body, right? This is my stuff, this is your stuff. This is my life energy, this is your life energy. Those are like our little soap bubbles, yeah? yeah. And that then when you like go pop and you go pop, then all of a sudden it's all just, it's all together. It's all yeah. one thing. It's all it, it, there. You can no longer differentiate between what's mine and what's yours. And that, yeah, that, that's like the difference between a dualistic mindset of separateness and oneness, or like a unified or yogic mindset. Right? Exactly. We look at everything so black and white, but um, I, and I think the reason we a lot of people, especially um, kids the people under the age of 16 like obviously go on TikTok, watch your content my content um all the other bullshit content that's on there like they watch it and they they simply look at it acknowledge it on a black and white level then scroll and when i say black and white i mean they they're, they're acknowledging it but they're not to the to majority of content and things they're observing they are not um applying a deeper thought train of thought to it they're simply yeah. looking at it, scrolling onto the next thing, looking at it, and they're doing this all day. And we do this ads, and we've been, we've been made to do this. We, we have so much to see and look at and do. We look at things on a level that I feel isn't deep enough. We don't, we can't just sit and look at rain and be like, shit, raindrops, huh? What the fuck? That is, that is so beautiful, but so weird. That just came from thousands of miles up in the air. Like what? Um, yeah. you. You sit next to someone and say, look, raindrops, and they'll be like, what, is, is this fucking cunt on drugs? Is, mate, you take some mushrooms or what? What about the raindrops? What are you talking about? Right. Um, we don't find beauty or actual meaning unless it's we think it's very important or society or culture thinks it's very important, I think, anyways. Um, but I went a bit off, off topic. We look at everything black and white. We don't observe things and think deeply about it i believe now yeah, that, that's a problem with over. duality like you, you're gonna have duality when you are constantly looking at things as physical and then the physical applying to you rather than you applying to the physical that makes sense kind of you lost me at the end but i know what you mean about the observer and like how quickly they can see into like the depth of yeah. something right like the kids on TikTok um seeing something and scrolling past it like it really comes down to a little bit of when the student is ready the teacher will appear right like you're not going to get you're not going to be interested in something that you're not ready for that might yeah. not be your lesson for that day or that year or that life so you're not going to be drawn to it you're not going to think deeply about it if it's not where you're at right but like for that so teenager What's that? You believe it's some sort of a uh, a stage thing, and you don't know when the stage is going to be, but you'll know when it happens. 
Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. a matter of like where you're at on that curve. Like, you could um, you could tell somebody who's further back on on. Like, I was talking to another TikToker um, a couple of days ago, and they were upset because a lot of the content that they put out was getting reactions from people that were like, "Oh, this is BS," or like, "I don't I don't vibe with this," or what have you. And he was like getting affected by it, and I was like, first off, don't worry what other people say, and second off, the reason that most people are going to react like that is because they're just not ready for that lesson. Like you can't, you can't yeah. shove something down somebody's throat. That's like if you went into a school of high schoolers or whatever, and you started trying to tell every freshman the senior level English literature stuff, they'd be like, I'm not even ready for this. I can't even, I can't even yeah. compute what you're telling me. So yeah. That's kind of how I look at it. Is like if something is. I remember reading stuff when I was younger. I was in, intensely curious about this topic, even at a young age. And I remember reading stuff that was just right over the head. I just couldn't get it. And then yes, it I... took years of walking forward and getting to the point where it was like, oh, now I. I would reread stuff and I'd be like, oh, now I, I can see. Now, now I can see. Yeah, and it's that process of um kind of realizing that you don't necessarily have to fast track through life like school perceives it to be you know you go into um you go to kindergarten then you go to primary school then you, okay cool gotta get through primary school then you go to high school okay cool gotta get through high school then in the, in australia you go to university us go to college or whatever um and you're like right okay now finish college and you get out there and it's quite literally not what you expected at all if you didn't have any like out of the outer experience during college university you're going to realize that you, there is no race the only person you're racing is yourself um and it's cool to constantly process knowledge and try learn as much as you can but you're only going to understand as much as you want to and you're actually interested in trying to understand i believe you can i can sit here and talk to someone about um spirituality and the profound things about life but if they don't want to hear it they're not going to listen but in 10 years someone can speak to them about that and they will listen to it perceive it properly and continue to educate other people on it sure and um that's happened to me and i've i've done it to other people where i haven't understand something and it's been explained again i've told other people and they've got annoyed by it sort of and um, that, that's, this is a good transition. So I want to talk about handling your emotions and how people can handle their emotions better. Cause I'm still trying to deal with this. Um, I must add smoking weed helps, of course, cause it shifts you into more of a chill stage of consciousness. But now, even when I'm sober, I can handle my emotions because I'm in a sense, hyper conscious compared to what I used to be. I can see that I have the switch, I control the buttons to my emotions, I turn off whether I'm sad or happy, and I can do it whenever I want, in reality, I can smile right now and just be happy, because there is no point in being sad, it might as well be happy, but um, when it comes to emotions, I want, how can we control it, because a lot of people can't, anger issues, domestic violence, killing is a huge problem now, and it's definitely sending us backwards to where we need to go it's about being aware of your emotions and that you control can control them and what you do how can people implement steps to um begin controlling it and begin realizing that they you know create their own reality kind of the emotion is much stronger than a thought right it is this gut feeling sometimes that can be very overwhelming and when when dealing with one's emotions i think it's important to off the bat sort of disclaimer or categorize individuals based on the amount of trauma that's being triggered in each emotion right yeah. so for the the average person sure it might be I could give a few steps and the average person might be able to move forward quickly in gaining some semblance of control or, or at least non-reactivity, right? You can't really control feeling upset all of a sudden, it's there. And it's just about how you react to it being there, right? Yeah. But if somebody is 
heavily, heavily, heavily traumatized by something, the capacity for them is going to be much, much more difficult to have some control over the reaction once the sensation is there or once the stimulus comes oh, in in an environmental fashion. It's much more difficult for some people and it's much easier for others. That being said, there are therapies for the for the people who are in a much tougher spot, but for the average person I can I can give a couple of things that have worked for me. Oh, um which is essentially to understand that at the core of all things is impermanence, that it's temporary, that everything that's happening is temporary. Now on a grand scale, your life is temporary, right? And on a smaller scale, the little feeling or the big feeling that you're having, the emotion that's occurring, also temporary. Now we all know this because, you know, if you walk away from a situation, that's causing a disturbance emotionally, you know that in an hour or so it's gone and you yeah. can now re-enter the situation. So when I was a kid, I would run away. That was my way of dealing with something, which is yeah. I think a healthy way as a child to deal with it, to just remove yourself from the situation. Now, especially if it's a dangerous situation, like if somebody's dealing with domestic abuse, something of that nature, if it's violent, get out, get safe. That's always square one. But I eventually began walking that back. So in the beginning, I would run away for a couple of days or like one day. Then I started leaving for an hour. Then eventually I started leaving for five minutes. I, and, I, and the conversation would be much different, right? Like it would get to a heightened place and I would bolt. Then eventually I'd get to a heightened place and I would take a break. Then I'd get to a heightened place and I would begin to communicate, listen, I'm, I'm feeling very emotionally triggered. I need five minutes and I would leave and then we'd come back and we'd continue and it would be more calm, right? Then I would walk that back to like a minute or so where it would be like without leaving. I would say I'm yes. very I'm very triggered. Yeah. I'm feeling very emotionally heightened. Maybe we just take a pause for one minute and just take a couple deep breaths here and just like revisit in one minute. And even in that amount of Recollect time, yourself. Yeah. yeah, even in that amount of time, there's enough calm that has moved through the emotion again, temporary, like they don't really last that long if you're not energizing. Them. So if Definitely. you're not like trying to keep it going, if you stop for a second, it just literally dies off. So and I would walk it back to that. And then eventually it became, I didn't need to take a minute. I could literally just feel it come up and I wouldn't energize it. I just in the same capacity. You're describing, you're describing everything I'm trying, I was about to say in my own personal experience here. Like um, it started off where I wouldn't be able to control my emotions and meditation helped with this most importantly, because I be could see, see my emotions. Yeah. I could see my thoughts go like almost like a slow river th through my head and me just observing them and they coming and going. Um, but yeah, now when I get angry, I f almost feel, you can feel that feeling in your head. You can feel the emotion welling up and you can stop yourself. Do some like Wim Hof kind of ice man breathing. Cause breathing is important. I it think comes it's back the most to the meditation, important. like that poise, yeah. that sharpness to be able to it's get off to of breathe. the train of thought. Like if you can get off the train, that's about to go crazy. And if you can yeah. kind of be like, wait a second, just for a moment then that little critical point is where exactly. I found the most success. And I so promise like, people it's the yeah. best feeling because I used to have like pretty bad anger issues on video games and stuff and I wouldn't be yeah. able to control it. And for some reason, I'll just unravel, you know, it'll just domino effect. I'll get angry at this and I'll be angry for the rest of the day. It's what, and yeah. then I'll go, you know, I've run away a couple of times as a child and that and yeah. It doesn't get you anywhere and obviously I don't need to do that anymore because I have sanctity within my own head. I don't have to run away in a physical means, but I can shift my thoughts in a just a mental means. I don't have to go anywhere because I can alter my perception. Um, just it's a reaction thing. It's like yeah, how exactly. you choose to react to the sensation in the body. 
it's really just sensation, right? Like yeah. there's mental sensations that we call ideas, and then there's physical sensations that we call emotions. And how you, in the observer role, react or choose to react to those mental and physical sensations is what's up to you, right? Are yes. you choosing to allow or energize the anger and go with it and say the things that it wants you to say, or can you, with a little bit of that poise from meditation, can choose to think, oh, this is okay. temporarily, I don't want to go down this road, let me like wait for a calmer thought, and I'll choose that and we'll go with that, you know? Yes. So it's that reaction. And once you get like the smallest bit of that and you realize just once you shift into a state of consciousness where you realize that, hold up, I'm just being angry because like I want to be angry. You know, I'm, I'm, doing, it, I'm yeah. doing it for no reason. Like it's just a yeah. reactionary, spontaneous right. thing, as is everything. But um, once you realize that, you, you become more free, free of your own restraints and chains. Um, yep. And that's where it's like the spiritual awakening because I feel... Um, I feel as if we are in a time where we're still very physically orientated in the future. Um, Terence McKenna talks about this, a spiritual awakening where we, through generation, will come to a point where we are aware that uh, of the actual means of living, the compassion, the loving, the community, and the experience of life. Not as a story, but witnessing it and the beauty of it. Like, we're not very conscious right now, we're very physically orientated in a way where we don't recognize ourselves as a part, as a key part of what is the earth and life. Um, yeah. What do you think, what is your opinion about a spiritual awakening? And do you yeah, think, I think it will it's, ever happen? I think it's like kind of how you hit on it, like the way that he put it, it, it's turning from the external, like looking outward to looking inward. Like yeah. the difference is if somebody is pre-awakening they're they're blaming they're they're putting external blame on everything um it's all very outward they're all you know they're very concerned with all the material stuff like how they look in other people's eyes it's all based on everything out there and then when somebody starts to look inward and realize like we were just talking about oh i can if I can just not react to the stuff in here, I can kind of control what's happening in my world, then that's like the self-inquiry aspect of self-awakening. And like, yeah, it, it really just comes down to self-inquiry of who am I, why am I here, what's going on, how do I gain some semblance of control over this highly technical vehicle that we're all driving. Flesh suit, yeah. yeah. And it's also like when you realize all this, you become much happier because you, f you realize that you create your reality and you find meaning in what you want to find meaning and it can be the simplest things. But um, this is going to be a pretty hot topic here because you said looking outwards instead of inwards. What's your opinion on Jeff Bezos going to space and all this space travel when we could be spending the money on preserving the earth for future generations? and? actually making a sustainable place on this beautiful planet that we can't we won't be able to travel to another one as like like this for thousands of years like um why what what's your opinion on space travel rather than just seeking inwards in ourselves because people have this perception that going to outer space will change something but i think if anything it will worsen it um we don't have to travel anywhere. We just have to look within ourselves rather than wasting gas guzzling rockets into space just to um, achieve what uh, a more, I don't even know what they're going to achieve with it. I don't believe it's going to be that commercial. I think it's just going to be for billionaires who want to get away from earth when shit goes down. So we're not, I don't think we're even going to get to a point to commercialism within space, but I want to know your opinion on why we're traveling out instead of realizing that you can find the outer spaces within, within yourself. I think that in these cases, my, my mind first went to, there's something individual that these people, that Jeff, that um, uh, 
uh, Elon is are that are that that's what they're working on. That's what their stuff is. That's what their spiritual work is. There's something to do yeah. in their in their process that that's their work, and they're doing it the way that they're gonna do it. The greed that they're dealing with is on a high level, but also but this isn't just this is government funding as well. Like this is taxpayer your money. money too. Like don't get me wrong, I'm all for fixing the problems at home before you know that's why i think that the military industrial complex budget should be just put into infrastructure etc like not to get too yeah. political but like on a spiritual spin on it like the way i actually look at it is like that all being said like material arguments aside um there's a there's there's a real possibility that there's something we're not seeing um that's beyond the material aspect and where my mind kind of jumped to, because I always look for the silver lining, right? Like you and I oh, talking course, about this is not going to change whether these rich guys are going to space, right? But of course, when they're up there, one thing that is heavily reported from astronauts is that the feeling one gets when looking back at Earth in its little ionosphere bubble of the atmosphere, just floating in the abyss is that they're like oh my god this is our one home it's this one little spot in the middle of all of this stuff and they come back kissing the earth so perhaps yeah. perhaps in there if jeff himself actually goes up if elon himself actually goes up that perhaps that sensation that experience so. coming back down means or even their billionaire customers coming back down perhaps will become yep. more philanthropic will have that same turn of mind so there might be their silver lining there and it's impossible it's, to tell but that's how i could possibly yeah. see that changing yeah. that is an amazing perception i don't even think about it that is definitely almost a third look at it a third view perception because um we we always think you go to space and then you know we'll colonize mars and then all these other planets and we'll just keep continuing as a species um but yeah i didn't think about that they very may well have the same what seems human reaction to seeing the earth where you where you're meant to be living and seeing how beautiful it is and then looking around and seeing how not beautiful everything else is yeah like hopefully they have that reaction that would be amazing um and with but you're right the military, there is an element of inflated ego and boisterousness and, and look at me and look what I can do. And there's all those it's things there too. Monkeys flying to space. There's no like existential meaning to it. We are simply just being in a way where it's very technocratic and advanced. We're just being with extra steps at this point when it comes to materialism, I think. You know, like my room, I have all this shit in my room that I don't necessarily yeah. need, but I want it because it distracts my time here. Right. So, there, there's a reason that monks, there's a reason that monks don't have stuff or money. Exactly. You know, like yeah. they're going in that direction. So, there, it, some people on those evolutionary scales um, are going backwards or are doing, you know, they're they're living lives potentially that are lessons for them, and and in this case, in a grand scale, you know, if very if grand all scale. of if all of this is like if you think about the soul as eternal or something that can't actually die and that it's here living a physical experience in a body that can die, then it starts to seem from that line of thinking that this is simply almost like a dream-like experience to, to like work on whatever the soul is working on through this material mm. plane. And that like all this stuff about them flying here, going there, it's all just like, what are they learning in this life for them? So like, I'm exactly. not really so concerned with what these people are doing. I'm far more concerned with what I'm doing and how I'm being, et cetera. Yeah. Um, if everyone was doing that, this world would probably be rid of a lot of evil and be a lot more peaceful and yeah, loving. Yeah. But um, people are so all the money would be orientated. Like first and, yeah. Yeah, they just, they worry about other people too much. Like, I say this from a perspective, um, when I was younger in high school, even after high school, I always cared and my mind was constantly thinking about, 
what other people might be saying about me. Like, I, did, I don't know if they're actually saying it or not, but you sit there and think about it. And I am, I'm going to call that idiotic. Idiotic in a sense where you're literally constantly putting yourself in a state of anxiety, worry, and negativity for what? For what? You're going to wake up fucking laughing. Like, stop. Um, you control your reality. And even if they are saying that stuff, that has no adverse effect on your life right now. Like, that will not affect your being and the state you're in right now. It is simply yeah. words. And, and we get so the, offended by the words. The first reality of it that old people will tell you all the time is nobody's thinking about you. <laughs> like, yeah. you're, you're worried about, oh, what are they exactly. thinking? 99.9% .9 of the time, they're not, it's already out of their mind. Like, they're this already the on this mind. Yeah. You got to realize. We're just worried like, about how we're perceived. Yeah. Look, look, in, look into yourself and you'll be able to understand everyone else because do you, when, when do you think about your friends? Like, when do you just think, oh, yeah, that guy's a cunt just randomly in your head? But rarely, when you're thinking, rarely. Yeah, very yeah. rarely. Like, people do pop up in your head and right. you do acknowledge them, but it's only for a very brief amount of time and you're not thinking very deeply. And if you do, then you probably have your own problems. Another um, way I also think about this topic, too, that might be helpful is not only this point that you just hit on, but also... The fact that if I only know myself in, in the degree that I possibly can, which is I'm the, the most qualified person to know about Parker, yeah. that means that anybody outside of me is severely unqualified Uneducated. to really yeah. understand me anyway. So. Exactly one person away like let's say your mother or your brother or some some family member might be the closest possible failure at looking at like who what's really going on with Very, you yeah and then once you start getting to friends and strangers and random people it's so far from true their guesses are just like laughably incorrect um that you can really kind of like take the weight away from yeah. or the validity away from it. Now, now if they see, you know, if they only know you through one action or one thing that you do, sure, they know one moment of your life and they can perhaps rightly judge you for that one action. But that's not to say that that wasn't the only time that you did something, etc. So in the grand scheme yeah. of things, it's going to be such a fine tuned thing. But you know, it it's it really just comes down to if if you're being true to yourself, if you're being a good person, if you're on the spiritual path, you're probably trying to be a good person. And that means that the stuff that you're gonna be doing out there in the world that people are gonna react to is probably gonna be of a positive nature. Like people that have never met yeah. me, when they commonly see me, because now I don't do any negative things, I don't lie, steal, cheat, etc then I'm being nice, I'm like helping, et cetera. The, the, the reaction tends to be positive anyway. So like once exactly. you let go of it, it doesn't matter. And then once you start doing the right thing, it's probably going to be a positive reaction anyway, and there's nothing to worry about. Yep. Um, and with positivity, like positivity is infectious, especially when there's nothing to um, dim it down, turn off the lights for it. Like, if everyone was nice to each other, at least presented in a physical means that they would like the person and were nice, just mainly to strangers and people you actually care about, um, it would become more normal. It's normal to just not talk to anyone as you walk past them, not say hi as you walk past people, um, and just completely ignore anyone that is not in your life at all. And when you speak to people that aren't, you speak to them in a way where it's almost lower because you may not even meet them again. But remember one you might and even if you don't your impression still matters because yeah. as i said i am you you are me and yeah. every impression you have on someone affects them and every impression they have on you affects you in some way whether the levels it affects completely varies with different people but um yeah I, people don't i feel like people don't grasp it and you've come to so much understandings and a true well developed spiritual person who can word himself very well 
And I'm wondering, would you consider Thank yourself you. almost like a um, dropout to society? Like a dropout to the uh, society we live in, the material, constant need for materialism and success in the means of being completely famous and rich. Have you dropped out of that train of thought and simply just want to be you and exist? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no, right? Do you think in, we can fully in this Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. You reckon? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. People do it all the time. Um, oh, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I'm, that's why I asked you the question. And also how you almost got to the stage of somewhat dropping out of um, society and the cultural standards we have to live up to in order to be accepted. I would say like I've been incrementally dropping out. Yeah. I've been step by step. I mean, I live in the middle what of were those nowhere. steps. Yeah. You know, I, I live in the middle of nowhere. I don't, you know, I've, what are, did you ask what are those steps? What are the steps? That's what I want, um, that's what I was asking because, uh, how old are you, sorry? I 36. actually didn't even ask, okay. 36, so 30, 36 years, what were the steps when you first started and then compared to now? Because obviously it would have to be incremental. I think in this day and age, you have no choice but it to be incremental from birth because from birth you were told you're almost fighting against it. Like you have to fight against this thing in order to be free from it. Um, right. So what were, what were those increments? Where did it start? Yeah, so it started with like full material engagement, like a kid usually has, like you said. Yeah. Uh, all the way through university, going into a, a career. And even like at a young age, I was always sort of like spiritually curious. So even in high school, I was already studying world religions and things of this nature. So I think the first stage is and always will be self-inquiry or like inquiry into like the deeper truths or nature of reality. Even without changing anything materially, you can mentally um, begin the process. Yeah. Um, so reading, uh, exposure to information, um, that's what started mm-hmm. for me and I didn't even realize till you just said that because that take, has taken me back from experiences when I was a kid and I did have like I did read a lot and although like I didn't know why I was reading these things I was interested you know and it was more interesting than just playing with shit and toys but yeah continue right. that is definitely well worded for sure yeah so it starts with knowledge like by knowledge that I will approach God right so you just want to get moving in that direction and then the impetus begins to be um how do i align my external world with what's then happening internally right so yeah that's why it's along the lines of like you know your actions your words the thoughts that you're energizing you, even if you still have a day job and you live in a city and you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend um being a good person doing the right thing these are all like steps towards this and then also you start to devalue material stuff right like when i look at somebody with like a flashy car or something of this nature to me i don't see like much inherent value in that i see i see an inflated ego right so once you get the mental going then the material stuff kind of devalues and yeah as you move towards that then eventually you find there's a dissonance between community of who you're around and the way of thinking or the mode of thinking and the people that you're speaking with the people that you find yourself around a lot so you tend to try to find a community or what's called the sangha that is supportive in some quality, right? Yeah. And for me, I found that here in Hawaii. So that's why I'm here is because I found some support because there's a lot of like-minded individuals. Then beyond that, for me, it became um, going into retreat properly. And, and I've only begun that process. So to me, I've taken four or five, 10 day trainings and silent retreats of meditation. So. Well, that's a real, 
sort of uh, style yeah, stuff? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was so actually going to do that, Nico. Do you recommend that to people? Um, oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, like, I recommend doing it just to get the training so that even when you're doing your daily sits at home, you're at least, like, trained in a real technique and you're not just YouTubing yeah. something or whatever. Is this with shamans and... No, no, no. This is like a traditional Burmese um, offshoot straight from the Buddha, like straight lineage oh, okay. of actual Buddhist meditations called Vipassana. And yeah. in training in that way, then you're all the things that we've been talking about for an hour, all of that begins to get quicker and easier because your Domino observer, your, fo your focus, everything gets sharper and sharper and quicker and quicker. Yeah. Um, and then to, to, to finish the answer, essentially those retreats begin to outweigh the amount of time that you're spending in the material world. So instead of 355 days a year material and one hour sits during the day and a 10 day off, it becomes 11 days off, 12 days off, et cetera. And it moves towards yeah. half and half. It moves towards years off. And that's how people tend to move. And and to be honest, I've heard of people just saying, cutting and running and just literally just going into the woods for a couple of years on their own. Now, I wouldn't recommend that because without proper training, without the Sangha, without the community, I mean, people have been doing this for thousands of years in a way that's very supportive and healthy. Um, we just don't have that culture in America, right? Because our religions yeah. are most, are not really based around that kind of a thing. That's why you find that more in uh, Asian cultures um, specifically um, and in Indian cultures specifically. So for me, that's how it's been going is like moving into more, like my day to day just isn't as focused on material. Like today I was in a waterfall with a couple friends and I went awesome. surfing in nature. I'm just yeah. more focused on if I'm so gonna be actually. in the material world, that at least it's like I'm present, I'm, you know, more focused, like I said, on the subtle stuff and that I do yeah. take time to meditate, that I do take time out of the year to retreat and that eventually, yeah, yeah you, you won't even be able to find me on social media. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I hope to get to the, some that point as well after I, I feel like I've sort of connected with enough people and shared what I wanted to share enough. Um, but my... Oh, we lost you. Hopefully he comes back. I'll host. <laughs> uh, well, this has been such an amazing conversation. He's such a good kid. And it's really interesting too, like, welcome back. It's it's interesting meeting like-minded people like this. It's, it, it's, it's really invigorating to see how quickly people connect. Um, I find this all the time. Um, yeah, oh, we switched sides now. I just talking to the audience, don't mind me. Ha! Um, I find it, my, my whole consciousness shift has been very, like, quite quick. Um, so, it really started, like, the end of last year. And I'm gonna pause for a second, let me throw on a couple of lights. My, uh, my sunset. No worries. Right, hold on a sec. Too easy. <laughs> Subscribe, like, there we comment. Go. Um, yeah, my, my control shift and I recognize it fully and it's almost been overwhelming sometimes and I'm proud of myself being able to control it and kind of, kind of, uh, voice crack, kind of move on from it at, to a high, another higher point of consciousness and awareness, um, mainly through meditation because while we're sitting here right now, it's been pretty crazy. Um, I meditated this morning for this and. I get visuals during the day and especially visuals when I meditate, even fully sober, I, I see geometry, rings, tunnels, and just light in a sense where it's very much 3D. Like you can see it as if you're here and then there's something in the middle. There's something floating in the middle of what you're observing. Um, and through this, I've learned to control my emotions. Uh, I've learned to know, get myself better and catch myself out on the traits that are inherently bad and completely ego driven. And we all need to recognize that. We all need to start recognizing ourselves rather than just being people for other people. 
you know, you're someone for your mum, your dad, your lecturer, your girlfriend, your daughter, your son, but who are you for yourself? And it almost frustrates me when we get to um, this level of it because people are putting themselves in situations where they can't even get out of these trains of thought anymore. They're getting themselves stuck into these things because they don't even acknowledge there's another option. And it sprouts from like actual systematic thinking and making people think they are, they are nothing less than physical being that dies and returns back to the ground. Um, and my perception on life has completely changed just in this less than a year, completely changed through psychedelics, meditation, and actually being realistic with myself. Um, what is life and thinking deeply about things that aren't necessarily profound in today's societies or Western culture. Like um, fast cars, you don't need a fast car. It's still like, you can buy some cheap Nissan and it'll still get you just as far as your Ferrari. Um, it's just a matter of how much money and how long of your life you have to spend to get that thing. Um, I feel like we don't pr pr prioritize uh, stuff adequately anymore. We don't put our mindset in the right places, which is why we have all these mental health issues and all these problems with suicide rates and genuine mental confusion where they're so physically orientated, they want to take their mind somewhere else, but they don't know how to. They don't know how to put their mind somewhere else. And um, yeah. got to say to people that you can, and it's by addressing those thoughts via meditation, I'd say, or psychedelics. Yeah. But um, my path has been super interesting. And um, this, the whole spiritual journey, it makes you a lot more happy, I feel. Like, have, how's your life changed since the beginning and the end, or to where you are now, not the end, the present? It's been, I mean, I wouldn't use the word happy per se because there's still stuff that gets to me, but it's yep. more manageable. It's more manageable, manageable and it's more realistic. It's more, I'm more capable of, like you said, witnessing when I'm dealing with thoughts and emotions based on the culture that we live in, et cetera, um, and not being um, swayed by external influence as, as having a stronger internal influence than the external has its ability to through the various propaganda, et cetera. And, yeah. uh, you know, the influence of the culture. So even, even though, you know, I mean, I will say though that like, you know, my, my friends and family would definitely call me a happy person. I just know that there's a lot more that I'm still of working course. on. So, but, yeah. but externally, yeah, I'm like, a total goofball and having a grand old time uh and i live and you're happy when life. you do it because yeah you think yeah. about being happy and you put it into physicality and then you're like well it must exist now i am happy you know if you yeah. if you sit here and smile sometimes you just become happy because you're smiling um and there's not True. a lot of smiles anymore i feel like we aren't smiling as much people well, uh, look at life contagious. as such a dull thing so you just got to keep smiling at others and yeah uh, let's yeah. Well, they'll either, they'll either think you're absolute nut job or just good vibes or both. Um, just stick with the good but, vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Stick with the good vibes. It doesn't really matter if they think you're a nut job. Right. Um, and that's a thing because from this, I feel like is actual sanity. You gain actual sanity. And, um, right. I don't want to call everyone else that doesn't, hasn't shifted into it yet insane, but it's a state of where. You're becoming a character. You're making yourself like a character in a video game rather than just being an actual witness, like being the actual video game, being a part of it, you know? Yeah. Um, and a lot of kids get stuck on that, and that's why a lot of the suicide rates are dramatically increasing, especially in the US when it comes to children and mental health problems. What would you say to your young... What, what advice would you give to your younger self, to someone like me who's 18... 17 who's trying to start off this journey and is being bombarded with work school propaganda like tech techno propaganda um 
career propaganda, all that kind of stuff. Not everything external is to seek something other than yourself. What advice would you give? All that information that's coming at not only young people, but adults as well, um, of course. has some purpose behind it. And I would implore those individuals to look at every advertisement, every influence behind the surface of it. Why are they doing that? They're trying to sell yes. you something or they're trying to get something out of it. There, there's somebody behind it that has some, uh, let's say motive. And I always look at what's the motive behind this thing rather than letting the actual advertisement work on me. So like if somebody says, you know, drink Coca-Cola, it's great. I start thinking, well, you're just trying to sell me Coca-Cola. Yeah. And the reality is, is that Coca-Cola is actually not that great. And, you know, if somebody says, you know, get a job or you're a bum, I'm like, well, that's probably just because your dad told you to get a job. Yeah. In that generation, <laughs> that's what it was about. Exactly. And if it's school, you know, why does the school exist? Well, because that's another machine and it's based off of the industrial revolution. Basically, once you look behind the curtain on anything, it falls apart. And it's about applying a deeper train of thought. Yeah, it's yeah. look behind the surface of everything. Um, and when, when you continually do that, you start to find things that do have value, that the motive behind them is something that you can get behind. And then yeah. you can then subscribe to the things that are in line with your core sense, that are nurturing on a deeper level and that aren't just being sold to you for somebody else's profit or somebody else's motive. So look at the external world, not on a surface level, but always try to get a few layers deeper and try to see past the facade of whatever it is that's coming at yeah. you. And then you'll understand it more deeply and you can analyze it from there because sometimes it is good. Sometimes the motive is of helping course. people and the advertisement is you know, to, to help or to project the right away. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and, and then, yeah. And a lot of times too, it's put, maybe put down the digital stuff and pick up the books because there's a lot more that I've found in older traditional media. 100%. Um, and, and oral traditions. That's just going to have a little bit more value to it. Yeah. And when it comes to, well, at least from my experience, you can only apply deep thought to so much thing to so many things before you come to a point where it's almost too much and people don't necessarily get to that stage of too much by just looking into things willingly willingly but just experiencing physicality physicality to the point where they want out they want out of this you know brain they're in they want out of their own body they're sick of existing as themselves and i think that's a lot of the reason why people drink take drugs, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So they shift into a state of lower consciousness. Yeah. And for someone who's done that before, and I have recognized it and um, reconciliated for it now, yeah. uh, you realize that you got to a, you're afraid. You're afraid of thinking at things so deep because it almost becomes frustrating that your brain's working overtime, but it's not. Your brain's not working overtime you perceived it that your brain can work as fast as you want it and you can think as deeply as you want about things but it's whether you feel exhausted by doing it and want to actually take the time to a applying a mentality of deeper train of thought where it's not like a bad thing it's not an exhausting thing applying a deeper train of thought is a necessary thing and we we only apply deep trains of thought to things we think really matter you know as the same theory of scrolling through tiktok black and white we're not applying deep thought to any of that because you know it doesn't really that matter you can scroll down you find something else um because well, there's, a you time, reach there's a time for that deep contemplation that looking beyond the things and you know asking all the questions and that's a it's a great time for like journaling right spiritual journaling or writing it out trying to get all that down 
There's a time for Is that. Is that how you stop the overwhelming feelings? Because it does get overwhelming when you have all this shit going through your head and you're thinking about yeah. so much. Oh, journal. oh, if you're not already journaling, that's a huge one. Yeah. Oh, I've got I'm, three books full already, but I was asking yeah. you for the audience. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's usually good to go through a contemplative practice and then also have time to not be in deep contemplation, which is essentially what meditation is. You're, you're not energizing another idea and ending up on a train of thought, which is contemplation. You're seeing the train come into the station and you're just not buying a ticket. You're just not yep. getting on board. Yep. And, and that relaxes the situation. Cause you're saying like the overwhelm is what's getting to people and the medicine is not getting on the trains is is con yeah. is the antithesis of contemplation is meditation essentially so if you're not doing but if you're only doing one of course you're going to end up with too much going on um of that you know and of course you're then going to look to alcohol or harder drugs to do the antithesis for you rather yeah. than taking the sober active approach of meditation which has all the other benefits of meditation along with it on top of the antithesis of the mental activity and then yeah journaling is another easy one it's just stream of consciousness onto a page max it out at say three pages and then cut it and stop and then yeah. go, go into your day that that's how i do it um, do you have a set time for journaling? I don't. I simply write when I Morning. feel like I want to write. Like last night, I got home from work at like, what, 11 o'clock. Um, got a bit stoned and I was tired as, but I just wanted to write. I was listening to a lecture by Terence McKenna and he said something about space. So I wrote two pages about space. Now, although I think it was a pretty good explanation on what I was trying to convey, it doesn't even have to be. The action of writing and just putting your thoughts into physicality helps so much. It is extremely therapeutic, yeah. and I agree. Yeah. Um, and you've been very well spoken. I think this has been a very progressive podcast, to be honest. And it makes me very excited for the future ones, for future intellectuals, because I hope people that are watching this now take something external from it. And even if it's a little spark in their mind that is flicked and switched on, 20 30 years from now still doing something you know and um more importantly i took a lot out of this which is why i mainly do the podcast but um yeah, yeah i appreciate it man so much good advice uh social details i've got to put parker's underscore paintings that's my bad completely forgot about that but okay. um instagram parker's paintings uh tiktok parker's paintings as well yep and I wanted to show yeah. this. If you're still, if anyone's still watching, I had this for the last bit because this is fucking awesome. So we won't be able to speak during this part. Um, but yeah, enjoy this video. Yeah, that is no joke, bro. That is awesome. Um, Thank if you guys you. want to go Thank check you. out that stuff, check out his Instagram. I think you should have way more followers than you currently have, to be honest. But um, yeah, keep inspiring people, man, because you are. And um, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Hope thank to hear you so more much of for you. having me, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's no been worries. wonderful talking with you. Um, yeah, same. I appreciate it. Awesome. Project Awaken, we'll play the in, uh, the fucking outro slash, in, slash intro. Have a good one. Thank you, Parker. Where's the intro? 
Thank you so much, man. There we go. Oh, I didn't play. You know what? This this is a good part of the podcast. I see the uh, clips of it.